Indonesia is one of the largest archipelago countries in the world, with more than 17,000 islands that spread over an area of more than 2 million kilometer squares. Indonesia is host to several unique ecosystems, containing a large number of diverse species. At least 10% of the world's flowering species, which counts to over 25,000 species, flourish in Indonesia. There are also 12% of the world's mammals, 16% of reptiles, 17% of birds, 6% of amphibians, and over 45% of fishes, all of which are parts of the nation slash biodiversity. In order to preserve its biodiversity, which also contributes hugely to the world, Indonesia has taken significant steps in accordance to the national and global target on biodiversity framework. The government has allocated more than 500 units of protected area spread throughout the country, with the total coverage area of 22 million hectares terrestrial and 20 million marine protected area. Because of its uniqueness and universal values, six protected areas are recognized as World Heritage Sites, 16 Biosphere Reserves, 7 Ramsar Sites, and 7 ASEAN Heritage Sites. Many studies and researches has also been conducted to identify plants and animals to assess their potential uses for medicine, food, energy, and biocontrol for a chemical hazard. Some community-driven activities such as ecotourism has also contributed to the effort to preserve Indonesia's biodiversity, which also encouraged cooperation among local stakeholders. The results are heartening. By 2019, Indonesia has been able to increase the population of endemic and priority species. Communities have also enjoyed benefits from this improved environment through ecotourism, environmental services, and other significant conditions, which contribute to their quality of life as a whole. There is little doubt that Indonesia's vast biodiversity plays a hugely significant role in reducing the impacts of climate change. By preserving its biodiversity and its ecosystems, Indonesia can help support the entire planet's sustainability and ensure a better future for all humankind. Sejarah Fakultas Kehutanan UGM resmi didirikan pada tanggal 19 Desember 1949 dan merupakan universitas yang bersifat nasional. Selain itu, UGM juga berperan sebagai pengemban Pancasila dan sebagai universitas pembina di Indonesia. Pada saat didirikan, UGM hanya memiliki enam fakultas dan salah satu di antaranya adalah Fakultas Pertanian. Dalam perkembangan selanjutnya, melalui Surat Keputusan Menteri Perguruan Tinggi dan Ilmu Pengetahuan nomor 99 tahun 1963, Fakultas Pertanian dan Kehutanan UGM terpisah menjadi tiga fakultas, yaitu Fakultas Pertanian, Fakultas Teknologi Pertanian, dan Fakultas Kehutanan. Dengan demikian, Fakultas Kehutanan UGM secara resmi dinyatakan berdiri pada tanggal 17 Agustus 1963. Dekan pertama Fakultas Kehutanan UGM adalah Profesor Insinyur Sudarwono Harjo Sudiro. Berdasarkan SK Direktur Jenderal Pendidikan Tinggi, SK Dirjen Dikti Nomor 163 tahun 2007 tentang pengaturan program studi dan surat keputusan rektor nomor 89 tahun 2010 tanggal 1 Februari 2010 mensahkan perubahan keempat program studi di Fakultas Kehutanan menjadi satu dengan nama program studi kehutanan program studi kehutanan terdiri dari empat bagian yaitu 1. Departemen Manajemen Hutan 2. Departemen Silvikultur 3. Departemen Teknologi Hasil Hutan dan 4. Departemen Konservasi Sumber Daya Hutan 
Di Fakultas Kehutanan terdapat Dewan Perwakilan Mahasiswa atau DPM yang berperan sebagai Badan Legislatif Mahasiswa dan Lembaga Eksekutif Mahasiswa atau LEM. Kemudian terdapat empat himpunan mahasiswa minat, di antaranya yaitu Keluarga Mahasiswa Manajemen Hutan atau KMMH, Himpunan Mahasiswa Budidaya atau Himaba, Family of Forest Product Technology atau Forestech, dan Family of Forest Conservation atau Forestation. Di samping itu, terdapat Badan Semi Otonom atau BSO yang meliputi organisasi pencinta alam atau Mapala Silva Gama, Komunitas Seni Kehutanan atau KSK, Keluarga Mahasiswa Islam Kehutanan atau KMIK, dan Forestry Study Club atau FSC. Sedangkan International Forestry Student Association atau IFSA dan Keluarga Mahasiswa Kristen Kehutanan atau BONITA termasuk ke dalam non-BSO. FFI bekerja di Indonesia sejak tahun 1996, yaitu awalnya bersama dengan LIPI untuk melakukan penelitian-penelitian, terutama penelitian terkait dengan harimau Sumatera. Kemudian berkembang, kemudian kita ada kerjasama dengan Kementerian Lingkungan Hidup dan Kehutanan, waktu itu Kementerian Kehutanan, terkait dengan pengelolaan spesies-spesies yang dilindungi. Tantangan terbesarnya adalah kata kuncinya sebenarnya kepedulian. Ya, kata kuncinya adalah kepedulian. Kalau semua sudah peduli, maka secara umum sebenarnya pekerjaannya sudah dan. Tapi masalahnya itu, bagaimana kita mendorong semua pihak untuk peduli menyelamatkan planet kita ini bersama-sama. Itu tantangan yang paling besar. Kearifan lokal masyarakat juga sangat penting di sana. Jadi di lain pihak kita melihat ada ancaman, tapi di lain pihak juga kita melihat ada kearifan masyarakat untuk menjaga hutannya. Nah itu yang kita coba untuk dorong untuk dikembangkan. Planet kita ini yang sustain, sustaining the planet itu jangka panjang paling panjang kita. Jadi itu tujuan jangka panjang keberadaan MFI. Bukan hanya di Indonesia, tapi di dunia. Okay, such a great video. Am I audible first? Am I audible or not? Please correct me. Okay, so good. Okay, well, uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Selamat pagi, Bapak Ibu. 
beserta rekan-rekan yang saya hormati. I hope that everyone here is doing well today. Welcome back to the What Life Conservation and Management International Conference or WECMIC in the Symposium 5. Let me turn just this myself first. My full name is Rizka Afi Muhammad, or you can call me Afif. I'm a fifth semester of undergraduation in the Faculty of Forestry at Universitas Gajah Mada. Again, it's a precious chance for me to be your master of ceremony on this very special occasion. Today, WECMIC Symposium 5 has the theme, the role of exit to conservation to prevent wildlife extension, including captive breeding, long-term rehabilitation for non release releasable animals, policy, and regulation. First, let's thank to God who have given us guidance, happiness, healthy, and mercy, so we can attend and participate in this special event, which is a track presentation session without any obstacle. I would like to welcome again Dr. Susan Shin as our session chair today and all the distinct speakers. Well, ladies and gentlemen, let's begin uh, this special event by the explanation about presentation guidelines. First, participants must activate their camera during their presentation. Second, the presenter's camera should be at eye level and the presenter should look directly into the camera when speaking. Also, presentation should be presented in English. And the last, presenters are, are responsible for ensuring a smooth network connection. Move on to the next agenda, where is the explanation for abstract presentation participant. I'm going to read it clearly. Only uh, two explanations. For the first is each abstract presentation participant is allocated 20 minutes, 12 minutes for the presentation, and eight minutes for Q and a session. And last but not least, participants are limited to three questions which will be selected by session chair. The next agenda is the abstract presentation. It will be joined by five institutions. They are Nusa Chandana University, Indonesia University, Indonesia Zeus and Aquariums Association, Faculty of Veterinary Medicine, Universitas Gajamada, and the last is Copenhagen Zoo Indonesia Program. The abstract presentation will be moderated by a very, very amazing person, which is Dr. Susan Shin. Dr. Susan Shin is a co-director of the Borneo Nature Foundation and BRINCCC, or Borneo River Initiative for Nature Conservation and Communities. Dr. Susan is a teaching fellow on the MSc in Pri Primate Conservation and Biological Anthropology in uh, Oxford Brookes University. Dr. Susan has carried out research in Southeast Asia since 1997 and in Indonesia since 2002. So then, uh, Dr. Susan works with several IUCN specialized groups advising on and leading conservation policy. And Dr. Susan is the vice chair of the IUCN section on small apes as well. Okay, let's invite Dr. Susan as our session chair in this session. Dr. Susan, time is yours and I give the floor. Thank you very much for that lovely introduction. That is a fantastic video. It shows in great detail the wonderful work and biodiversity of Indonesia. It, it makes me very much miss Indonesia. Saya rindu sekali hutan Indonesia dan teman-teman saya di sana. Jadi ya baru jam tiga pagi di sini di Inggris. Jadi saya harus bangun pagi-pagi. Tapi saya senang sekali bisa ikut. So <clears throat> we have a selection of very exciting presentations. Uh, but I wanted to hopefully uh, give a, a small overview of the history, I suppose, of, of humans and captive wildlife. So can I share my screen? Should that be possible? Seems to work. I think that seems to work. If it's yeah. not working, please shout at me. So this session, I started my career looking at 
the pet trade of, of gibbons first in Thailand. This is a subject I, I think is very important and has a big role to play um, in situ and ex situ conservation. So just a little bit of history. Having animals in captivity goes back thousands of years. And especially with primates, because they are so close to us as humans. And we've used animals in captivity to look at fulfill human needs for companionship, for labor, for entertainment, and of course, recently as test subjects in scientific research. And still to this day, having animals in captivity can be seen as a status symbol. And there's a long history of especially using primates as pets. Images from Egyptian tombs 4,000 years ago um, and, and, and how important, for example, baboons were in, in Egyptian culture. They were so important, they were given the same respect as humans and mummified and buried and sacrificed to the gods. A long history again of, of cultural influences of wildlife on humans. I said, you know, baboons were trained to harvest figs back in Egypt. And again, this is depicted on tombs and something that is still happening today where we've got macaques going up picking coconuts. But of course there are as we learn and as we will hear from our, um, from our speakers, there are still problems and challenges with having animals in captivity and how that we have to learn from this and how we can use this the knowledge that is going to be shown and presented today across such a range of species about how we can use our increasing knowledge. Just because we did do something in the past doesn't mean it's good to do it in the future. So a lot of things we have to think about with animals in, and wildlife in captivity is, is it ethical to do it? But of course there are benefits sometimes for living in captivity and especially how we can use knowledge of animals in captivity to help with rehabilitation programs, to also help with wild conservation. We can improve husbandry techniques that mean that we can better care for these animals. It does of course provide a little bit of protection from predators and disease and starvation when we're looking at critically endangered species. But we must also think about the welfare of wildlife in captivity, in zoos and in rescue centers and in long-term sanctuaries where the animals perhaps cannot return to the wild. So we have to think about their physical well-being, their psychological well-being, providing space, um, and how does that relate to our, our ethics? So many questions that we have to think about and we will get some of the, the answers and it's a conversation I think we have to carry on going forward. So finally, there's a lot we can learn and there are, do, I do absolutely believe there are links between what we know from captive, captivity, which can apply to conservation in the wild and the other way around. We can raise awareness about the plight of wild animals to the general public. We can provide basic data that can be reproductive biology, genetics, diseases, and improve veterinary care. We can provide training opportunities for people working with wildlife. And of course, ex situ populations may act as a genetic reservoir for species where wild populations are threatened. But of course, wild populations are still threatened by the removal of wildlife for the pet trade and how we get animals acquired by zoos and for use in research. So a lot of challenges, but I do believe that where you see many challenges, there are also many opportunities. So without further ado, I am going to uh, introduce our first speaker. So I'm delighted to introduce uh, Gloria Lado from Nusa Chandana University, who is going to be speaking to us about the biodiversity study in the wetland essential ecosystem area as the habitat of the reintroduced Roti Island snake-necked turtle. Um, and I will uh, leave it to Gloria to pronounce the scientific name. So I believe I put myself on mute and I think, Gloria, the floor is yours. I look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, thank you for the opportunity for me. My name is Yenikada. I'm studying in Nusa Cendana University. 
I will present about biodiversity study in the in the island where land essential ecosystem area as the habitat of rain index Rote Island snake nether turtle or Saladian corby. Next, uh, the introduction. Rote Island is home to the critically endangered Rote Island snake nether turtle. The, the Rote snake nether turtle uh, is the only turtle species living on Rote Island. Also, the first species of the genus Saladina to be listed in Cetus Appendix 2 since 2005. Uh, this, this species is listed, listed is uh, then endangered by the IUCN and listed as a national priority and has been protected since 2008. Three legs, uh, Peto, Lidu, and Landoen are designed as wetland essential ecosystem are the protect the turtle, but still lack of information on its biodiversity. PPK is the INTP, support by Wildlife Conservation Society Indonesia program and Wildlife Research Singapore uh, initiating reintroduction and preserving snake necker turtle. There is Nusa, Nusa Tenggara uh, provincial government to signet Peto, Ledulu, and Landon Lake is EEA wetland with the issue of governors. Decree number 2004, uh, KIP head ski 2019. Essential ecosystem areas are ecosystem that are designed as protect and manage area based on conservation principles. Areas that are ecologically support of lift top biodiversity conservation effort. This is new release uh, for WCS about the designation of Rote Essential Ecosystem Area, the habitat for the Rote Islands make me Next, uh, The aim of the study is to determine community structure of hepatofauna bird and macro invertebrate at the three legs. The survey period of this research was held on September to November 2020. Uh, this research was conducted on three legs, which are Lake Peto, Lake Lendo Oren, and Lake Ledu. Then procedure of the study. Uh, there were five steps in this research. Uh, two are uh, set up sampling point, make transit, field collection and sampling, a measurement of abutic factor, identification and data analysis. Further identification of microinvertebrate was conducted at entomology laboratory of Lipi Cibinong West Java. Now we move to research and discussion. There are three main research, microinvertebrate, herpetofauna, and bird. First, the microinvertebrate, uh, result present of microinvertebrate. Micro Based on the field sampling of microinvertebrate, on the three legs, Ledu lacks the highest present of microinvertebrate. Follow, follow it by Peto and Lendo Owen Lake. Next, a uh, result abundance of microinvertebrate. From the chart, we can see the 50% of microinvertebrate. 53% of microinvertebrate is from Gedidae family. These are, these are the picture of Pitisidae and Geridae family that we found in uh, those three legs. 
Now we move to second main research uh, that is catatophone. There are 12 species, three amphibian and nine star reptile. They were found in the true lakes. And Landoan uh, Lake has highest presence of herpetofauna, uh, 11 species. Followed by Ledulu and Peto Lake. Uh, you can see in the slide, uh, this is one species of herpetofauna. The we found it is Draper tumorensis. We are so lucky uh, that we were able to see this endemic species in Landulaito Lake. Uh, this is uh, the picture of the endemic herpetofauna species. And there are the picture of herpetofauna species found in those three lakes. Next, a uh, result abundance of hepatofauna. From the chart, we can see the Ducapirinus ictus was found in abundance in Lake Peto and Mendoen. Uh, meanwhile, in Lake Ledulu, this species took the second place after Pergifaria lunotari species. This is this is highest and lowest abundance of macroinvertebrate. The highest abundance value was uh, found in the Ducaprinus melanotictus species, uh, 48%. The lowest abundance value is found in the species of Litteria sp1% and uh, Hemidactylus pernatus 1%. Next, uh, let's move to the third research with a bird. Uh, there were uh, 40 species that were found during two research study in those three lakes. In lake, in the lake, we found 28 uh, species of bird. In Lendo Owen Lake, we found 25 species of bird, and in petal lake, we found 22 species of lake uh, of bird. Uh, you can see in the slide among those 40 species, uh, there are three endemic. We are uh, Toracoena modesta, Orialus melanotis, and Minops latensis. These are the picture of bird the frequently found during this research. And next, a result abundance of bird. For the chart, we can see the Colocalia infuscata and Amandava amandava species were found in abundance in Petal Lake. Species Colocalia, Colocalia infuscata and Ampromictus jupiter Joquilatus were found in abundance in Lendo and Lake. Meanwhile, uh, Loptura puctulata and Peser montanus uh, were found in abundance in Ledulu Lake. So this is the picture of uh, species Amandava Amandava that has the highest abundance of value 15 percent. Meanwhile, uh, these are a picture of five species. They have the lowest abundance value 1 percent. Next, uh, it's a community structure and microinvertebrate. Uh, Hepatophone and birds. First, uh, first the microinvertebrate. The struggle of the microinvertebrate community and the EEA of Rote Islands show a low diversity in the category. The evenness among species uh, was relatively uniform. The, the dominance criteria was low. 
Next, uh, result community structure of hepatofauna. The structure of hepatofauna community show a low diversity in the category. The evenness among species was relatively uniform. The dominance criteria was low. Next, research community struggle of birth. Uh, the struggle of birth community show a medium diversity in the category. The evenness among species was relatively uniform. The dominance criteria was low. Next, uh, research measurement of abiotic factor. Measurement of abiotic factor in relation to abundance, abundance of macroinvertebrate, hepatofauna, and bird. First, the, me the measurement of, of abiotic factor, uh, macroinvertebrate, like water quality is considered good best on quality standard from Indonesia government regulation number 22 of 2021 implementation of environmental uh, protector and management. Next result measurement of abiotic factor, hypotofona uh, and bird. Uh, based on the res result or uh, environmental quality quality measurement one variable that show a significant different namely like intensity. Next, the compilation of study. For a small island, such as Arote Island, the lake still harbored a diversity of wildlife. 27 different family of macroinvertebrate, 12 species of herpetofauna and 40 species of birds. Highlight, highlighting the value of Rote Wildland Essential Ecosystem Areas, the structure of the microinvertebrate and herpetofauna community in the EEA of Rote Island show a low diversity in the category. Third, show a medium diversity in category. The evenness among species of microinvertebrate, herpetofauna, and birds was relatively uniform. The dominance criteria was low. This is the last of my presentation, and thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much. Um, how are people going to send questions? I forgot to ask that. Will they come through the chat? Yes, the, sorry, uh, uh, Susan, yes, the questions should come out from the chat. Wonderful. So, um, in that case, then, I would like to invite questions, please. While we're waiting, can I ask a question? Um, I was wondering, <clears throat> do you, how many of the turtles have been reintroduced onto this island? Gloria, <clears throat> Gloria, can you hear me? Yes. Sorry, I was I was wondering how many turtles had been returned or reintroduced um, onto onto this island. Uh, Twelve spaces. Thank you. Don't 
see any other questions in the chat. Not, not yet. Um, I thought the presentation was very good and very clear about a good, like a good study design. It was very clear about the um, the surveys and the um, uh, and ha and how how it was done. So, I mean, understanding the the potential reintroduction site, so doing a habitat assessment like you have done is so important before returning animals back to the wild. So thank you, thank you very much for that. So yes, please send your questions in the chat. No questions. Mungkin semua cukup jelas, jadi tidak ada pertanyaan. Well, perhaps if there are no further questions, maybe people still need some small time to think about it. We might uh, be able to come back a bit later if somebody has maybe one or maybe maybe a question that they are still thinking about, and we can come back and, and ask you about it. So, thank you very much. It's sometimes a bit uh, scary to go the first presentation, but thank you very much for that. So we stick with turtles. Um, and next press presenter is uh, Fadli Mohammed from Indonesia University. And we are going to hear about sea turtle nesting population and habitat in, um, uh, I've printed this too small so I can't read it, but we're going now to North Sulawesi. Uh, so yes, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, thank you for the change, Miss. Uh, first, uh, let me share screen. Okay, is it clear? Yes, yep, I think we can okay. see that. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Fadi Muhammad, and here I would like to present my research that was conducted in September last year in 2020 on North Sulawesi about sea turtle nesting population in Tanjung Benaran, Pulau Mondo Selatan. The research itself is sponsored and supported by VGS Research Fellowship Program 2020. So I really thank you for the VGS. Okay. The first section of this presentation is the outline. And here are the outline of this presentation. There are introduction, materials and method, result and discussion, conclusion and reference. Introduction. Let's look uh, into the Let's look into the introduction first. Indonesia is the largest archipelagic country in the world has a high level of marine biodiversity. Its strategic geographical location makes Indonesia the center for the diversity of coral reef species. Imagine 400 species with an area of up to 8.5 million hectares. And then, marine biodiversity also has a function as a support for primary human needs through economic activities in the fisheries and marine sector. Hence, we can say that marine biodiversity, including coral reef species, has a meaningful effect on the economic growth of Indonesia. Indonesia is a key habitat. 
but what is a K habitat? K habitat are the sites which provide, uh, provide for the existence of rare and endangered species having highly specific, specific demands for the habitat. So uh, we can say that the sea in Indonesia is the key, key habitat for many ETP species or endangered, threatened, and protected species, including sea turtle. And we know that sea turtle are highly migratory species, uh, which is a species that move from one habitat to another during different times of the year, which means they have more pressure from environment and predator compared to non-migratory species. Hence, with all of the circumstances, sea turtle itself is protected. There are several organizations in international sea turtle protected by IUCN. As we can see that all sea turtle species are listed on IUCN at least as vulnerable, endangered, and critically endangered. And then in CITES, uh, it's in Appendix 1 CITES. And of course, uh, in Indonesia, it's protected by Ministry of Environment and Forestry. And... Uh, as we know that six out of seven sea turtle species in the world are found in Indonesia, so Indonesia is uh, amazing. Okay, here we go. Uh, this is the study site. Uh, we can see that uh, in the location in the left, the picture left, is the beach where the monitoring conducted of the research is conducted. And in the middle, there are hatchery and the hatchling of Peter Bell sea turtle. And in the right one is Mr. Hanafi from WGS that helped me a lot during the research. So, uh, there are two objectives uh, of this research. The first one is to understand the nesting population of sea turtle using secondary data from irregular monitoring activity since 2014 and primary data collected by walking around the beach during the night to support sea turtle from September to December 2020. And then the second one is to know the characteristic of the sea turtle habitat. Okay, uh, next uh, we talk about the material and method. So the location is in Tanjung Menaran, Bulaan Mondo Selatan, North Sulawesi. Uh, we can see in the map in the left, the yellow surrounded by strip black is the place where the research happened. And we can see in the map the corridor forest here in the green mark. The corridor forest, it was actually for the Malio bird. Uh, as we can, as we can know, as as we know, Malio bird was protected an iconic uh, symbol of Sulawesi. So basically, the beach itself was nesting habitat of Malio bird. That's why, within study of sea turtle, we can strengthening the status of the location itself. And then next, the, the time, the primary data collection from 5th September uh, till 5th December 2020, approximately three months. And the observation time was at hour uh, each day from 9 p.m. to 5 p.m. And then the secondary data collection was conducted incidentally, uh, the data itself from 2014 until 2020. This is the study site, as uh, previous before I told, the left one is Tanjung Jiran Beach, and the right one is the research course uh, Iparuntu. Okay, uh, we're talking about the tools and material. This is the several material that we use uh, in the research. There are flashlight, headlamp, GPS, thermometer, tent, stationary, scales, caliper, pH meter, and thermometer. The object itself is the sea turtle. Uh, the right one is the hatchling of letterback sea turtle, and the right one is the hatchling of uh, olive riddle turtle that died in the hatchery before uh, released to sea. Here we go to the sampling method. The first one uh, we do is uh, searching for nest location, cleaning, uh, and then we clean the marine debris to maximize the arrival, the arrival of turtles. And of course, to prevent threat to see turtle like entangled in the marine debris. And then we do a measurement of beach characteristic, including the length, sediment texture, and length of intertidal zone where the occurrence of the tide uh, happened. And then we do a vegetation analysis. As you know that uh, vegetation have a relationship with sea turtle nesting. And then we do a hatchling monitoring, uh, monitoring nest, sorry, to prevent the disturbance uh, from the predator, like crocodile or monitor lizard. And then we do a hatchling transfer. And then the, the last, uh, lastly, the data complication was to an analysis and obtained secondary data from BGS. 
Here we go to the result and discussion. So, uh, for three months, only one olividol sea turtle was found on September in 21 in plot A 156. Here we look in the comparison between sea turtle in Tanjung Binaran and Naglian. Uh, we can see that uh, the depth of sea turtle nesting in Tanjung Binaran are likely more depth, it, uh, approximately uh, 46, 40, 16 centimeter, uh, but in Nagaland, Jawa Timur, it's only 37. Uh, but for the nest diameter, it's more likely uh, smaller than the Nagaland, Jawa Timur. And for the egg amount, we can say that uh, it's uh, more or less the same. And for, uh, for the footstep size, is 18, like that. Okay, here we go. Uh, we can see in the graphic in the left is the sea turtle nesting session, season at Tanjung Meneran. Uh, so the graphic in the left is the nesting season at Tanjung Meneran at 2019 and 2020, 2020. As we can see here, the olive riddle sea turtle have a different peak season for laying egg, but they have something in common. It was starting from January to June. Uh, and I do a comparison. In Manokwari, Papua, olive riddle sea turtle have a nesting season between May and July. Meanwhile, in Nagalat, East Java, the olive riddle turtle has a season lying between April to September. And then uh, for the litterback sea turtle, we can see that the litterback turtle have an egg laying season from June to September. And do a comparison, in Mudaspa, Medi Papua, litterback turtle have a nesting season from April to September. And in Wellman, Papua, the Tabak turtle have a nesting season from October to March. Hence, uh, okay. Hence, for this graphic, we can conclude that the nesting season of uh, sea turtle in each area is different. Okay, we talking about the number of turtle eggs in Tanjung Benaran. As we can see in the graphic in the left. For the letter back sea turtle nesting in Tanjung Binaran, uh, we can see the graphic in the left from 2014 until 2020. Uh, the, there are uh, four types of uh, four species of turtle laying an egg in Tanjung Binaran. Uh, we can see that. For the green sea turtle, it's only laying egg in 2014, and for the hawk's bill sea turtle, it's only in 2015, and mostly uh, dominated by the olive video sea turtle. As we can see that from 2014 until 2020, uh, there are uh, olive video sea turtle, but uh, in 2020, it's uh, there are uh, little back sea turtle. Here we're talking about the hustling percentage in Tanjung Benaran. So, uh, the data itself only have a uh, data from 2019 until 2020. The olive riddle hustling percentage decreased from 2019 to 2022, 2020. It's from 53% to 15%. Meanwhile, in Bali, on Serangan Island Beach, the percentage of uh, olive riddle turtle is uh, quite high. On the, other hand, on the other hand, for the litter bag sea turtle, the hatchling percentage only 45%. It's classified height, uh, it's classified height from the litter bag turtle species. As we know that the percentage of litter bag turtle hatchling in semi-natural nest in Manokwari was only around 7.1%. So uh, basically it's uh, quite high for the litter bag turtle, even it's only 45%. And here is the number of hatchling release. As we can see that the data is uh, got from 2019 until 2020. It's uh, as we can see that the most uh, release egg is in 2019 for the olive turtle on June. It's approximately uh, 500, and for the letter bug turtle, it's in 2020. And it's uh, in Augustus, uh, approximately it's 100 and more. 
And here is we do a morphometric uh, comparison. So basically, in the Tanjung Minarayan, it was never done. So we do a measurement of the com measurement of the morphometric. So the the morphometric that we measure is the CCL, CCL and TL. So perfect carapace length, perfect carapace width, and the total length. As we can see that the for the letter back C total, the max is in 6.5 and 10.4 uh, for the TL. So you can see in the graphic that this is the result of the measurement. Uh, the, the story for this measurement is to make sure that one day uh, in the future when we do a measurement again, is there any different or not? Okay, uh, for the marine debris. The total weight of marine debris in Tanjung Minaran was uh, to to 23.2 gram per meter persegi, this was uh, relatively small when compared to acidic at all in this research in 2019, who counted marine debris at Tongkaina Beach and Talawan Bajo with up to uh, 1,433 gram per meter persegi. However, both beach were tourist areas, so there is a lot of activities. Meanwhile, Tanjung Minaran is an essential ecosystem area where human activities are very limited. And here is the result of the marine debris. We can see that the proportion of plastic waste is the type of waste that dominates according to research acidic et al. in 20, 2019 and Zukov et al. 2017. The beach is an area that has a higher tendency for plastic waste because the waste is easy to transfer. So we can see that uh, from the type of waste is the plastic is the dominated one. This is uh, the Sitalco nesting location in Tanjung Minaran. So basically there are uh, 10 plots in here. The plot itself is contained a uh, subplot that have a size of 25 meter, equal 25 meter. So this is approximately uh, 30 kilometer length. So here is the location of the Sitarco nesting in Tanjung Minaran. So we do a uh, measure an environmental factor like the temperature, the average temperature of Tanjung Minaran in 2020 is uh, 28.4 and highest temperature recorded in 2020 was in February with approximately 13.3 and the lowest temperature was in August, it's uh, approximately 25.3. The research on green uh, turtle eggs show that if the sand temperature is uh, more or less uh, 32 degrees Celsius, the egg hatch within 15 days, while at the sand temperature of 2, uh, 24 degrees Celsius, the eggs hatch in more than 18 days. So basically it is uh, important to do a measurement of the temperature of the sand so we can see if it, uh, there are correlation in it. Okay, we talking about the habitat characteristic. In Tanjung Minaran, uh, Tanjung Minaran is a white sandy beach which has a length of approximately three kilometers. The beach has a coastal zone with measure from low tide to the limit of the vegetation zone. The weight of the beach is quite narrow and when the tide rises, the highest water arrives within only approximately 2.1 meter. Tanjung Minaran has good vegetation because the result of the vegetation analysis shows the value of age equal to 3.06, which is high in diversity. Lab analysis shows the soils in Tanjung Minaran has a physical characteristic of 93% uh, sand, 6% dust, and 1% clay, which is good for sea turtle, uh, because it will make the diameter of the, not diameter, the, the depth of the nest is quite high. Okay, we're talking about the Tanjung Minaran vegetation. So, uh, basically, there are 36 uh, species of uh, vegetation in Tanjung Binaran. The tree vegetation is dominated by Cucos nutifera, have an NV value of 30, and the lower crop vegetation is dominated by Ipomea pescaprae. And then, the total value of the vegetation diversity index in Tanjung Binaran is uh, 3.06, which is uh, high. Here is the picture shows us that the uh, Description of the vegetation structure on the Tanjung Minaran coast. So uh, here, here is the picture of the letter bark sea turtle and the olivedal sea turtle. We can see that in five meter is the location of the nest, and the next two point five meter is the vegetation, including the Ipomea capracae that dominated in there, and then the next one is the 
Ya, Kokos Nuki Vera. Like that. We talk about the Sitako treats in Tanjung Menerang. So, in Tanjung Menerang, there are three uh, treats that we found. The first one is the abrasion, as we can as we talk uh, previously. The the beach itself is got uh, occurrence tide is happening highly, and then the second is anthropogenic factor like uh, marine debris. This is the picture of the marine debris, and then the third one is natural predator. Predator. There are several uh, predator in there, as we can see in the picture. There are crocodile, monitor lizard, and then the bird. Uh, as we know that in hatchling, the litter can affect the hatchling transit period, which is the time it takes for the hatchling uh, approximately uh, to 24 until 36 hours to leave the nest and sweep away from the beach. So it was uh, really uh, bad for the sea turtle, the marine debris. So there are two conclusions that we got from this research. The first one is there are four, four types of turtles nesting in Tanjung Menerian. Data from 2014 to 2020 shows, shows the trend of turtle nesting in Tanjung Menerian is dominated by the olive fidel sea turtle. Until 2020, there were, there were uh, 11,000 eggs of the olive fidel turtle in Tanjung Menerian, but the hatchling percentage of the turtle eggs was still low, namely uh, for in, Five, five, uh, 3.3% in 2019 and 15.3% in 20, uh, 2020. The percentage of letter bed turtle hatchling eggs of uh, it is uh, approximately for uh, 45.2%, uh, uh, but uh, it was uh, quite a high for the letter bed turtle. And then the second conclusion is Tanjung Binerian has a habitat characteristic in the form of vegetation dominated by Cocos nucifera and Ipomaya prescaprae. The result of the vegetation analysis are 3.06, which is, which, uh, which is high. However, Tanjung Binerian is a small beach, so habitat loss is uh, very easy. The beach is 3, three kilometer long and wide only 90 9.89 meter. This makes the nest on the Tanjung Menerian beach prone to seawater immersion. There are uh, several suggestions for the next uh, research, maybe. The first one is the regular monitoring of sea turtle nesting population is needed to determine the trend of population in Tanjung Menerian. The second, research is needed to understand the effect of anthropogenic threats on sea turtle nesting success in Tanjung Menerian. The third one is management and regulation such as reducing fishing activities at night can be limited when the turtle nesting season has reached and hatchery and environment can be done to minimize turtle dying in the nest. This is the reference. Maybe it's for me. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the uh, change. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think we have a couple of minutes for questions. There is one question in the chat um, asking, is there any presence? Perhaps um, the person who wrote that maybe could provide a little bit more uh, information about the question. Please. While we are waiting on that, I have one question. Um, you, you mentioned that on the beach there is a, mostly the Ridley, uh, Ridley's turtle, sorry, or olive, ol Ridley olive turtle, I think. Do you think there is competition for space between the four species because you said it is quite a small beach? Okay, thank you for the question, Ms. Um, Susan. So, I think uh, for the competition is uh, uh, maybe it's uh, rarely happened because the structure of the beach itself is quite long. So, if we see from the data, data in sold us in 2014 until 2020, it shows us that there are actually four 
si turtle nesting in that area but for the you know for the hawksbill si turtle in the past past time is it it is a, 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 a treat from the local people so actually in that Uh, in that places, the local people is still eating the eggs, but it is in the past. So for the hawksbill sea turtle, because the the eggs itself is quite small, so they say that it is quite delicious. So maybe that uh, that's why the the you know the turtle of the green sea turtle of the hawksbill is uh, quite small in there. I think it is the reason why the poor uh, sea turtle only. Only uh, uh, only dominated by the olive green turtle because uh, that kind of you know that kind of trade like that. Uh, but maybe if uh, we want to know the competition in there, we need to do uh, more research in there. Uh, but uh, till now, uh, I have I only can answer like that because that was what I know. Okay. No, oh, that's very interesting. Thank you. I yeah. think maybe with the. Uh... With this, it's uh, we, you have to perhaps monitor the uh, the adult females as well and see if there if there is space. But it's very exciting. Two very exciting projects on marine work. Thank you very much. So, without further ado, I would like to introduce our next speaker, Dono Semyadi from the Indonesian Zoo and Aquarium Association who will be speaking about the Indonesian um, Global Species Management Plan. I think that's GPS, GSMP. So global collaboration to support research of the ungulate species in Indonesia. So without further ado, I would like to hand the floor over. Thank you. Hello? There appears to be from my end a small connection problem. Pat Gono, can you hear us? Oh dear. We appear to be having a small technical problem, people, so please do bear with us. Ah, Bagono, I think you are back. I hope you are back. Ah, sorry, yeah, I have a problem with the connection. No problem. Uh, please, when you are ready, share your screen. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. I hope it's all on screen. Uh, yes, just waiting. I think for, yes, I think it's just not yet in presenter mode. Yep, it's now in presenter mode. Everything looks good.
I hope it's on. Uh, yes, I think it is now. I think it's now back. Mm -hmm. So ho hopefully, hopefully this is working. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for uh, allowing me to uh, representing from the Pika Nations. Uh, what we are going to do here is just to socialize about our activity as an in ex situ institution in Indonesia regarding our global works with the uh, Global Spacious Management Plan. The aim is to show our contribution of ex situ to in situ conservations. So first of all, would like to introduce our organization, which is the I. Uh, it is the National Zoo Association, the only one in Indonesia. And it was founded back in 1969. Currently, the membership are 57 of the zoo and aquarium spread in 18 provinces in Indonesia. 57 zoo is uh, representing about 70% of the total zoo that is exists in Indonesia based on the uh, surat izin uh, issued by the uh, KLHK. And over 57 zoo, we are looking after almost to 5,000 species with a total of the individual of close to 70,000 animals. Of those 5,000 species, 70% of them are as the national species or the Indonesian species. So uh, since 2014, PKB has has developed what we call it the Action Indonesian GSMP that we are aiming to conserve a specific target species. They are Anua, Banteng, Babirusa, and Sumatra tiger. And those species with the uh, Action Indonesian GSMP, we are partnering with the several global institutions from the IUCN, from the Ice Asian Wild Catters, and from the Singapore Zoo Wild Pig Special Group, and from the East Asia European As uh, Zoo Association, as well as from the United States or the North American and Australian Zoo Association as well. Uh, what is the Global Species Management Plan or GSMP? It's actually an international collaborative conservation plan focused on the long-term survival of the target species. The GSMP concept it's developed actually by the world of the uh, zoo associations. And there have been several GSMP all over the world, as you can see in this. And four of them are coming from the Indonesia. And for Indonesia, the GSMP work is emphasizing for the ex situ population linked to the in situ. What is that means that within the action of the uh, GSMP, we do have four main goals, genetically healthy global exit to population. We stress here global exit to populations, meaning that we are not aiming only for the uh, species they are covered within the Indonesian zoo, but also the Indonesian species, which is cover in the several zoo overseas. The second goal is to raise awareness among the zoo visitors about our target species. The third one is to use zoo expertise to help in situ conservations, depending what of the uh, country needs. And then uh, depending on the, the expertise that we have based on our experience in looking after of those four species species. And the fourth one is to prioritize and support the in-situ projects. And that basically is supporting the national strategy and the action plan for the species that has been developed in Indonesia 
what we call it with the strategy dan rencana aksi konservasi of the several species. And that shrug for Anoa, for Babirusa, and for Sumat uh, Sumatran tiger, and for Banteng, it's there. So we are basically supporting of those national target as well. Now, in general, the key activity of the GSMP, we do have four key activity. The first one, of course, increasing the population and improving genetic diversity. The second one, sharing husbandry skill and building capacity so that the population number can be increased within the Indonesian zoo. The third one is the uh, part of the, our responsibility to the community by raising awareness about our target species to the uh, visitors or to the uh, common of the people outside there who love with the ex situ activity. And the fourth one is assessing the status of the wild populations. That's what we call it is to the ex situ link to the in situ works within the Indonesian scheme. The first one, when we are looking deeply to the increasing ex situ population, we have done the activity for almost six years to currently. And during that uh, five years, during that five years, we do have recommended about the breeding time transfer of the individual that it exists within the Indonesian zoo. And of those as well, we are following the breeding recommendation of Enoa, 8 Babirusa, and 16 Sumatra tiger. Why we are doing establishing about the uh, transfer, the breeding transfer, it is just to make sure that the genetic quality within the uh, captivity is in the good quality. The bird following the breeding is successful. At least we do have uh, several numbers of the bird from the uh, breeding transfer that we have developed for the past five years. Now, if we are talking about the increasing is what is the target for the next 100 years with the 90% genetic quality. That is the baseline of our formulations about how many individual should be available within the ex situ with the aiming that the existence of those species will be there in Indonesia for the next 100 years with the genetic quality close to what it is in the wild. And we are targeting at least 90% similar of the genetic quality to the in the wild. So if we have set for the uh, activity based on the 100 years, and then we look the existing populations. Here is the representative of the three species. If you can see for the Banteng in Indonesia, we do only have 86, whereas outside Indonesia, there are 203 individuals. Anoa, we do have 37, and in the global population, there are 182, and the Babirusa 75 in Indonesia, and globally, there are 190. In order to reach 100 years to be exist with the 90% genetic quality, formulation has come up to the minimum target that should be there either in Indonesia or overseas. In Indonesia, at least we should have 100 individual for Banteng, 75 for Anua, and 100 for Babirusa. Overall, globally, we have to reach 300 individuals for Banteng and Anua and Babirusa around 355. Reaching this target, meaning that we are reaching what we are aiming to be so far for the conservation for the next 100 years. But the priority target is the existence of the population within the Indonesia. So currently we are focusing in how to reach the minimum population number within the Indonesia before we come to the uh, 
global collaboration for providing any global population within Indonesia, uh, outside of the Indonesia. Reaching 3,300 individual with 100 in Indonesia, at least we do have, we need at least 30, what we call it, the founders. The founders is that the individuals that carry the best genetic quality, and then using the founders that we are, the, our aiming to reach a 90% genetic quality of the population can be established. So that is what we call it the founders. In here with the Banteng, out of 16 what we do have currently globally and nationally, we need 30 individual. The meaning that we are uh, short in 16, uh, 14 individual. Similarly with the ANUA, it sounds like that we do have enough population number for the founders, but for the Babirusa, we still have short around 18 individual of the founder. So in order to improve our genetic quality, then we should know what is the current quality of the individual that we have, at least in Indonesia. Doing so, then we have done collecting blood sample from the targeted species among the uh, Indonesian zoo that looking after the target species. And the idea is we try to put a demographic pictures of the individual that we have and try to identify which one that has carried the white population blood and which one that has a high inbreeding number within their blood. By doing so, Hello, Pat Gono, can you hear us? Ah, we have more technical problems. Hello? Hello? Yes, can you hear us? Did I miss yes. on the first slide presentation? Um, I can see, no, I'm sorry, I can hear you, but uh, we cannot see your presentation here. Oh, it's starting. Yes, we can see the taxonomy, origin and relatedness data. Okay. So basically for the improving genetic diversity, we are aiming to building up the relations among the individual that we have in Indonesian zoo, which individual that still carry the high quality of the wild blood and which one of the individual that carry already a low quality of the genetic in the uh, ex situ. By doing so later on, we are hoping to map which individual that can be act as the founder and which one individual that is cannot be used as the founder due to the uh, low quality of the genetic of the genetic within the white population. That is for the aiming of the uh, genetic study. And the second group, it's uh, our activity is sharing husbandry skill and capacity building. With this sharing husbandry skill among the uh, zoo internet, the global a zoo from the North America, from the Europe, and from, either from Australia, is basically to improve our management and skill in, in 
improving our welfare of the uh, operational welfare for the species and targeting the improvement of the population number. Based on the uh, four years of the activity, we have done 28 trainings, 12 of them virtually due to the COVID since 2020, but the aim target is transportation training. The transportation training of the recommendation for pairing the individual, which individual should go to which zoo, and that requires a special training for the transportation. And we do also related for the uh, in situ uh, work, we do have training as well for the rescue training for the ANOA and Babirusia. And we have also established what we call it the collection plan and enclosure design. This is basically to improve the welfare of the uh, animal standard. And last one is the zoo educator workshop meaning that we are aiming to have from an individual of the zoo, we do have a specialty for the educator about the animal or for the, what we call it the zoo educator. Something that is not quite common yet, but it is now gaining a lot of the uh, uh, important, uh, important activity to reach the uh, uh, visitor to have a concern, uh, co concern about the conservation of the species. And the third one, this is the implementation of the raising awareness. We established what we call it the Action Indonesian Day, which is, it is uh, basically all over the world through the Zoo link and also in Indonesia. Within Indonesia, a webinar with the young generation, and we the uh, status of their designated white population, which is for the uh, Banteng, we are focusing helping the national park in Alas Furwa, setting up and supporting the existing monitoring of the population through the camera trap that has been done for several years by the management. But at that time, the area is not covered as the whole area on the grid system. So we are topping up the number of the camera that can cover the whole area of the Alas Purwo, so we can gain more representative numbers of the existing population of the Banteng in Alas Purwo. And through that one, we are hoping to gain some clear information about the real population in the in situ starting in Alas Purwo. So for the upcoming activities in 2020, we are going to the uh, third round of our GSMP plan for the 2020 to 2024. And then we are going to set uh, the third round of the breeding and transfer recommendation as well among zoo since during the past six years, as I mentioned, there are several numbers of the uh, uh, breeding that has been successful. And then we are now trying to setting up which individual that can be choose as the good individual to be used as the founder for the future generations of the individual species within the Indonesian zoo. Also, remember we still support the in situ activity and then we are aiming to reach Sulawesi for the population monitoring targeting on the Babirusa and Anoa and we are still looking for the base 
for the best locations where monitoring can be set up for the Babirusa and Anua so we can have the good idea of the existing population number in the file in the wild. Education training for the in-situ organization, which is for the NGO, we are targeting as well. So as part of our contribution to the in-situ, to the NGO that who works hard in the in-situ, we are also targeting to those uh, NGO. Then we are now currently pinpointing to which organization that we would like to ask for the collaboration for the next round of the GSMP program in Sulawesi. Husbandry training, it's still as the standard for us as husbandry training need to be improved from time to time based on the existing improvement of the technology and the knowledge about the husbandry. So that is our works as the exit to organizations and in our GSMP, as I mentioned, it involves so many institutions, so many zoo, either in Indonesia or globally. And thank you very much to all institutions that have already contributed, either in the funding or in the, the in the capacity building throughout our GSMP work in Indonesia. Thank you very much, and I am handed over to the moderator. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> thank you for managing the uh, technology issues. Um, we are running slightly late, but I think we, sh we can have time maybe for one question. Uh, there has also a question has come in for, um, uh, for Fadli about the uh, sea turtles in North Sulawesi, but I propose we complete all of the speakers first and then we can return to questions for any of the any of the speakers so we'll look in the chat so thank you very much for that it's 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 exciting to see what is being done and especially with international collaboration to help conservation in Indonesia. So please do keep thinking about questions for all of the presenters, but in the interests of time, we will move on um, and we will return to questions for anyone um, at the end. And uh, so Fadli, yes, one question has come in for you, which I will come back to. So our next presenter is Kansa Karisma Wan, I hope I've pronounced that right, from the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine at Gajamada University. And this is going to be on the identification and prevalence of soil transmitted helminth eggs in Javan Gibbons and the Javan Langor. Uh, so obviously on the island of Java. So without further ado, I very much look forward to this because I am a big fan of Gibbons. So um, yes, please, the floor is yours. Uh, okay, thank you for the chance, Dr. Susan. Uh, allow me to uh, present my presentations. We can't quite see it yet. It looks like you are presenting, but it's a blank screen. Oh, wait, here we go. Okay, uh, can you hear my voice loud and clear? Yes, we can hear you and the presentation is now also clear. Thank you very much. Okay.
Uh, I'm sorry for the technical delay. Uh, so uh, right now, can you see my presentation? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Uh, sorry for the further delay. So uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's been a great honor to be able to talk here, sharing, discussing about the current situation on wildlife from uh, so much point of view. So uh, first of all, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Tan Sakarit uh, On behalf of Isma Professor Budya Stuti and Mas Arif Setiawan, uh, I would like to present the identification and prevalence of soil transmitted Halmin X in Javan Gibbons and Javan Langurs at Petung Kriyono Forest. Sorry. Oh, okay, so be, before we discuss any further about the uh, so transmitted helminth infection in primates, I would like to enlighten the current situation in the Tongkriyono forest. You know, as you all knew, over the last decade, the development of social media is, uh, has infinity potential, and yet uh, it might have good or bad impact. So speaking of the good impact, uh, ecotourism uh, is well known for its natural attractions. It causes trend among the tourists. Uh, they take a picture and then share it on social media. And later on, the rest of the world will know about that place and the cycle goes and on and on and so on. And like there is no stopping to it. So uh, eventually the increasing tourism activity uh, demands better and more tourism infrastructure. And eventually, in the end, uh, local community welfare can be achieved through ecotourism, eco especially from the economic point of view. And now, uh, previously, I state that uh, there is, there is uh, an effect from tourism and human activity. And so I have an open question for every single of the audience. Uh, can we achieve the same thing about the local community welfare, but uh, from the point of view for from the animal. Well, in this case, I'm talking about the uh, freedom from the animal success. They had to be free from hunger and thirst, discomfort. They had to be free from pain, injury, and disease. They had to uh, able to express their normal and natural behavior, and they had to be free from fear and distress. And now uh, let's get to the essence of this slide. Tourism activity or human activity. Uh, on prolonged uh, continuous exposure, uh, it might uh, uh, make the primates become habituated to human presence. And later on, it can cause direct or indirect interactions, either it was low, medium, or uh, high. As for the tourism infrastructures, uh, of course, in order to uh, build the infrastructures, you need to, to clear the area. And when we clear the area, our boreal primates are not in the beneficial side because their canopy connections to cross between the habitat uh, is become less or become lost. And it, they, it can, there is always a possibility that they force to go to the ground, use the roadway access, and eventually they become exposed to the predators, exposed to uh, vulnerable from the roadkill, from the vehicle that was passing by. And later on, they are exposed to the soil transmitted helmet as uh, the potential zoonosis aside from virus and bacteria. Okay, so uh, the aim of our research uh, is limited to the identification and prevalence of the soil transmitted helminths, but the data we achieve uh, can, can be used to explain the current condition of the soil transmitted helminthiasis in arboreal primates. So later on in the next futures, if there is a major change in the habitat, uh, we can use it as a data comparison and we can create it for the mitigation strategy. Okay, so we will proceed on the study of the area. The study of the area is located in Potong Kriyono Forest, uh, Pekalongan Central, uh, Cent Central Java Regency uh, Province in Indonesia. The route of track uh, is spanning for about five kilometers and starts from Sapokembang until Tugu Petung Kriyono. As for the sampling site, we have two criteria. The first one is the roadway point. We have 11 sampling sites. And for the second one, it's the inner part of the forest point. We have uh, three sampling sites. 
And as for the time, there is three sequence of activity time. The first one is uh, the foraging fruit, focalization, and defecation. Mostly happen in the early morning until 11 p.m. The second one is the uh, resting. It usually happen in early afternoon until mid afternoon. And the last one is the third sequence, which is happen during the late afternoon. And the days start getting darker and the time is start avoiding the roadway point. So the reason we use uh, the first sequence of activity time because it is the peak activity where we can collect the sample of the thesis. Okay, so for the faculty uh, collections, uh, we use the observations of their behavior, behavior until they start to defecate. And once we've got where the spot is, we wait until the primates leave so uh, we don't disturb them. If there is no sighting of a defecation behavior, uh, we search the area because sometimes uh, the fecal sample is just around the urination smell that was uh, excreted by, by the primates. As for the present samples, all we need is a sample bottle and wooden spoon. And then we give 10% concentration of formalin as a preservation until the surface of the feces is covered. We tempor temporarily uh, put the feces on the ice gel and the ice stove, and later on we can keep it uh, longer in the chiller. Okay, uh, so the lab analysis, uh, we had two different methods, mini fault tag methods for Javan Gibbons and flotation methods for Javan Lang. Uh, the principle between these two methods is actually quite the same. We use the saturated solution of salt and the solution will sorting out matters by its density. And then the soil transmitted helmet X will flow and the debris will way too heavy and remain on the lower part so that we can check the soil transmitted Helmin X under the light microscope with 10 times until 40 times objective lens magnification. Okay, uh, for the result, uh, we conclude that there is three distinct morphology that we found in both Jeff and Gibbon and Jeff and Lang. The first one is the order of strong leader, which has key identification of segmented X. The next one is the order of the Raplipida, which has the key identification of larva to X. And the last one is the order of Enoplida, which has key identification of a pair of polar plus. Okay, so are we going to discuss uh, much further from the order of strong leader? Uh, upon this order, uh, we recognize that there is three distinct types of uh, X. The first one has thinner shell. The second one has thicker shell compared to the first one. And the last one has a smoother segment compared to the first and the second one. The identification from the order of strong leader can't be conducted using morphological only because uh, most of them had similar appearance and they had no key identification. There is why to sum up, we discussed that there is three possible strongulus or segmented so transmitted helmet possibility. The first one is the strico strongulus. They have been reported in Hainan Gibbon and Japan Langur. The second one is the Oesophagus Tohum. It has been recorded in apes, in white birded gibbon, and also in Japan Langur. The second one is the Ankylostoma duodenal. Uh, they have been never reported in Japan Gibbon and Japan Langur, but in vitro or DNA based or protein based method identification is needed to confirm either the stoma is the first reported in Japan Gibbon and for ankylostoma either it would it will be the first reported in Japan Gibbon and Japan Lang. Okay, for the next one, we're gonna discuss further about the order of the Rapidity there. So uh, we recognize there is three distinct form of larvae. The first one is the fully folded, the second one is the curved larvae, the second one is the folded larvae. Morphology, morphological analysis and compar comparison indicate that three distinct forms of the larvae, uh, it might be due to the time differential when we collect the sample, or it can be caused by the formalin effect. And a strong illogist has been reported in the old, old world monkeys great age uh, can be found in Lar Gibbon and it has been confirmed also in the Japan Langur. But for the Japan Gibbon, especially in the wild habitat, uh, it's quite rare to see this uh, strong illogist. 
Uh, so the next one, we're going to discuss further about the Anoplida uh, or the order of Anoplida. They had two key identification. The first one is the convex block. The second one is the flat block. As for the first one, we discovered that the convex block is uh, ca categorized as the tricuris and has been reported in New World Monkey and an Old World Monkey. And for the research done by the Fauzi, uh, it also been reported in the Japan Langur and Japan Yumi. And for the next one, we have interest, interesting findings uh, that there is a possibility of the capillary infections uh, on the Japan Langur. They have never been reported in any of the uh, Asian apes or even the Indonesian apes, including orangutan or and Japan Bidu. But this capillary uh, on our research is, was found on the Japan Langur. Okay, so we are now discussing about the salt transmitted helminths occurrence. The amount of samples that we achieved from the Japan given is 72, and 23 of them is confirmed to be positive. As for the Japan Langur, 46 of the sample is achieved, and 22 of them is considered to be positive. Okay, so from 23 Japan given faculty sample that's been confirmed positive. 15 of them found in the roadway point, and eight of them in the inner part of the forest point. For the Japan Langur, 22 fecal samples that's been confirmed positive, 11 samples found in each roadway and in inner part of the forest point. So later on, uh, we conclude that the Japan Langur population is more exposed to the soil transmitted helmets. Okay, as for the prevalence, the Japan Langur has higher prevalence. And from our discussion, Japan given is morphologically arboreal since their forelimb is longer and it, it will it less likely for them to go to the lower part of the forest or even to the ground and exposed to the soil transmitted helmets. While the Japan language, they are so well habituated to human presence. They compared to the Japan given, they always run away to the inner part of the forest once they spot a human on site. Japan langurs will remain on their place, not being bothered by the human presence. And higher prevalence on Java Langur might have been related to the same morphology with long tail macaque that has been spotting crossing the roadway access and near the Kroyakan site. As you can see on the map, it was the closer site that closest to the human settlement. And there is always an open possibility that Java Langur might have been less arboreal than we have ever thought, and they might came in contact with ground or soil. As our new interesting finding that we found the Java Langur parks on the side of the roadway, since there is no electricity wires connection system around the roadway of the Petung Kriyono, uh, it is uh, highly possible that this uh, Java Langur corpse is killed by the road kill from the vehicle that was passing by. Okay, as for the soil transmitted helmet order distribution and infections, as you can see, the Javan Gibbons dominancy is from the single infection of Stromilida, while in the Javan Langur, the dominancy, the, the dominancy is taken by the single infections of the Enoplida. Okay, so now we've discussed uh, further more about the dominancy of the infection of the Swamilida. Our research uh, from uh, 72 samples, the prevalence of Swamilida is the highest. There is 25% of it. And the other research from white virgin Theban, Oesophagus tomum aculatum, that was included in Swamilida, also has the highest prevalence in uh, order of Swamilida. So there, we see there is a, a pattern that uh, the strongly the infections in given is always at the highest point. Even though there is a wide difference in percentage, uh, it might be due to the sample size. Our sample size is 72, and at the research, the sample size is only five. Okay, and now we are discussing further about the infection dominancy in Japan. Lang. As you can see, the order of Enoplida has the highest prevalence. And we, as you can, as you also can see, uh, the research done by Fauzi and Tiwari 
uh, the Tricuris Tricura that was also included in the order of the Enoplida also has the highest prevalence. So there is a tendency of the order of Enoplida to dominate the soil transmitted helmet infections in Japan Langur or any other land. But of course, further research needed to conclude the dominancy of the Enoplida infection in Japan Langur or any other Langur. Okay, so now we've come to a conclusion from our identifications. Uh, there is three order. The first one is the order of Strongylida, and, and we have the genus possibility, three called Strongylus, Oesophagustomum, and Ankylostoma. As for the order of Rabditida, it's only Strongyloides, and based on our research, it, it was found in both Javan Gibbon and Javan Langur. As for the order of the Enoplida, Tricuris infections found in both Javan Gibbon and Javan Langur, but the infection of capillaria only found in Javan Langur. Okay, so our suggestions uh, the use of in vitro DNA based or protein based method to definitively identify the soil transmitted helminths uh, could help to erase the three genus possibility in strong leader. And these three methods can definitively identify soil transmitted helmet X until the species level. As for our second conclusions, the higher prevalence of Javan Langur might have been due to the factors of the rate of arboreal of its primate itself, the rate of habituation to, her, to human presence, and the rate of habitat fragmentation. As for the sampling side, Javan Gibbon uh, has more soil transmitted helminths X that was found in the roadway point. And meanwhile, the Javan Langur, the amount of the soil transmitted helmin X that was found is in equal size between the roadway point and the inner part of the forest point. Our suggestions uh, is joint research is uh, needed to get to know the correlation between primate behavior, habitat, and soil transmitted helminths. And right later on, uh, this joint research uh, can affirm, confirm, and strengthen the factors that was uh, mentioned before. Okay, and the last suggestions: massive infrastructures such as ecotourism or expanding the roadway. Well, it, of course, it can cause uh, a landslide and a further loss of the canopy connections. That was not beneficial for the uh, arboreal primates such as Japan Gibbon and Japan Lang. So. Uh, these massive infrastructures and agriculture need to be considered and executed wisely so that uh, the humans can, and the animals uh, feel the beneficial thing. Okay, so if in the next features, a major change in the habitat is inevitable to a point it causes a forest fragmentation, perhaps the severe one, Artificial canopy can make to connect each habitat so that the so that Javan Gibbon and Javan Langur uh, do not uh, doesn't expose to the roadway access and they are can uh, thrive and live. Okay, uh, the last uh, our, this our our knowledge our knowledge man, our grandest gratitude to us Faculty of Veterinary Medicine UGM Perhutani and Pemda Kabupaten Pekalongan. And of course, this research can't be done uh, unless we have this support by the Fort Wing Zoo, Monday Nature, Ostrafa, and Suara Oa. And this is the supporting ref reference that we use. And of course, the last but not least, uh, I would like to say thank you for this chance. And if you don't have the chance to ask some question in this conference, you can contact me from this three account. And if you need further information of my phone number, you can just ask me on that three accounts. So I think uh, that's it, that's all. Uh, thank you. And I uh, give the chance back to the moderators again. Thank you very much. Thank you, it's very interesting. Um, I think we will if, see if there's maybe one question now Otherwise, I suggest I'm on the wrong chat. Hang on. That's why I can't see anything. Um, I suggest that we will continue to have an opportunity for questions at the end. So maybe we will run over a small time. Maybe some people have need some time to think of questions. I definitely have one for you, but um, 
Um, I will ask it now, actually. I think um, I suggest that we need a lot more information about um, research on, on the captive and wild primates uh, parasites. A lot of work has been done on orangutans, so it was really great to see work on, on gibbons and, um, and langurs, but I think we also need it in wild and, and captive. Um, do you think that this, this, this is an important expanding area of research for, for Indonesian primates, especially for conservation and maybe ecotourism? Thank you. Okay, uh, I would like to answer the question from Dr. Susan. Well, I've uh, never thought that uh, the research about the wildlife was solely and merely on uh, one aspect, perhaps. We need uh, more point of view because, uh, as you can see, I do realize that my research needs further uh, data, maybe about the habitat, maybe about the behavior. Well, of course. Uh, this is, uh, for me, is uh, such an expanding uh, area of research because uh, later, uh, I hope that later on in the next pages, my research could inspire a lot of uh, aspects and others, uh, such as from biology, such as from forestry and veterinary, that, so that they could work together and make a solid and concrete uh, uh, result of research. I think uh, that's my answer. Thank you. Thank you. No, I completely agree. Collaboration between forestry, habitat, government, university, Yayasan, researchers, everything is needed for effective conservation. Thank you very much. So before we have the final questions, we have our last speaker of this session. Um, Rudyar Anissa from the Copenhagen Zoo Indonesia program, who will be speaking to us about the caesarean section procedure for dystocia, I hope I pronounced this correctly, I'm not a vet, sorry, in the Javan warty pig at the Javan warty pig reintroduction program in Baluran National Park, Indonesia. So thank you, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Susan. And I will uh, start to share my screen now. Okay, uh, it's my presentation and my voice can be seen and heard clearly. We can see and hear you, yes, thank you. Thank you very much and uh, good morning and good afternoon everyone. Uh, today I will share uh, to you all about our works uh, about the cesarean section procedure for dystopia in Javan Wartipik uh, at Javan Wartipik reintroduction program in Baluran National Park, uh, Indonesia. Okay, uh, as some of you might already know, uh, Balura National Park is located in Situ Bondo, East Java, and it is covering 25,000 hectares, and I believe it is small by now, actually. And the National Park are compri uh, comprising a system of a diverse ecosystem, such as mangroves, evergreen forests, uh, but uh, actually they are dominated by a unique savanna area. Although right now we are uh, battling with Acacia nilotica. Uh, this is uh, one of uh, views of the savanna with uh, several uh, Acacia nilotica that right now we are uh, doing uh, eradication as one of the programs. Okay, uh, as a brief introduction, uh, the Balora National Park along with the Copenhagen Zoo and other partner established a reintroduction program uh, for Javan Wartipi which has been declined locally in the national park and uh, before that uh, Japan Wartipik itself is uh, an endemic uh, species in Java Island uh, and we now we probably know more about the Susprova more than the Susferrucosus itself uh, which is uh, sad because the Susprova itself uh, was uh, intro introduced a long time ago and I think their growth is uh, much more uh, bigger than the Susferrucosus uh, itself. And then uh, in 2018, uh, we managed to build the enclosure 
it's located in the Valora National Park area. And then uh, the enclosure itself is in one hectare area. At first, we built the enclosure and divide them into two main cages, two feeding areas and a transporting area, completed with a chute cage to, uh, in the future, uh, move the pigs. Uh, this is the aerial uh, photograph of the enclosure. Uh, as you can see, uh, this is supposed to be the uh, main cages. And then uh, these two small, uh, smaller cages are the, the feeding area. And then uh, this is for the transportation uh, purpose. And then uh, come a long way, we successfully, uh, I wouldn't say successfully, but we managed to uh, grow our population. And the uh, water pigs uh, are, came from uh, different places and we managed to get some uh, individuals from the wild. And the wild area is from Bojonegoro, also in East Java. And then we also uh, have some of our uh, pigs came from uh, Taman Safari, uh, both from Brigen and Tisarua. And then we also have uh, from Chikananga Conservation Breeding Center in uh, PPS Chikananga. And right now we have uh, 15 uh, individuals in our enclosure. So uh, right now we, uh, we are trying to provide a more suitable uh, area for those pigs because they are came from different location and it can be a little bit tricky to uh, regroup them. So then we uh, already made some more compartment and right now we are having total of eight compartment and we also use the feeding area as uh, cage now, so we don't uh, specifically use uh, those cages for feeding purpose only. And now the total population is uh, 15. As you can see in the picture, we made uh, some little editing to uh, better describe the, the situation in our enclosure right now. So uh, for the Javan water pig itself, uh, they are quite hard to distinguish from the common Suscrofa actually in the wild. But the main difference feature would be the wart itself. That is where the name came from. But unfortunately, the wart only grows in adult male. So uh, I think right now, the easiest way to uh, difference them uh, from the Suscrofa is the lighter color in the abdomen. Although it's also still quite a little bit difficult because it really depends on where we uh, get the picture of them. So this is one of the uh, our uh, male uh, ward typic, so we can easily see the ward here. And then the, I will show you another picture to uh, better show the lighter color on abdomen later. So for today's uh, discussion, we are focusing in actually one uh, female pig called Maureen, which uh, came to uh, Balura National Park on 2019. And this is the first time we rescued them. And then uh, this is uh, approximately close to where the event occurred. Uh, they are uh, one year and six months old at that time, 18 months old. So uh, those two individuals are forming a group of four. Uh, pigs uh, consist of two males and two females, while uh, the two males, one are categorized as adult and the other are uh, sub-adult, same as the females. And this is where, where they are uh, situated. After they are being grouped for six months, uh, they are together since October 2020, the keeper noticed uh, nesting behavior and enlargement of abdomen on candies. Uh, and then on April 1st, the keeper found a dead fetus uh, and the, the, the mother candies was observed as active with a normal appetite. And then uh, on uh, April 4th, the keeper found another dead fetus. Uh, this time it was already dry and rotten and candies uh, was also observed as active with normal appetite. And then the next day, uh, Candice in the morning was observed active uh, with normal appetite, but later in the evening, Keeper found her laid down on the stomach with a uh, dysnay or uh, hardly breathing with uh, no reflex when the Keeper tried to approach her. Even though they are stay in the uh, enclosure for most of their time, uh, they are still uh, very uh, skittish and uh, cannot be, uh, whenever we try to come close to them, they will always run. 
So this is the picture of the first fetus that was found. And as you can see, actually the fetus are not completely developed at that time. So, and then this is uh, when we found Candice uh, lay down. And then sadly, uh, after we tried to do uh, emergency uh, care for Candice, we cannot save her life. And uh, after we uh, give uh, some um, vitamins and antibiotics, uh, she stopped breathing and no heartbeat found. And then we uh, do the necropsy and we found uh, her uh, uh, physica urinaria, or you can say a, bled, a bladder, was uh, fully uh, fully filled with the, the urine. So it can be also one of the cause why uh, the there is uh, one pig actually here. Uh, it cannot be exploded uh, normally, so the fetus are stuck there. And then this is after we uh, managed to pull out this one fetus uh, from uh, her vulva. And as you can see also, it's not yet uh, developed. And I think uh, it's already squeezed there for um, maybe a few days since we found uh, the first fetus uh, five days before the event occurred. So uh, after we knew uh, what was happening uh, with Candice, so we still have one more uh, females, which is Maureen. And then uh, after we also uh, noticing enlargement of the abdomen on Maureen, uh, this time we move her to isolation gates and we gave her extra amount of enrichment for nesting and everything, uh, more food uh, to, uh, to give her better environment for her uh, pregnancy. And then on April 30th, uh, in the morning, uh, we saw fetus rear legs extruded from her vulva. And then uh, the keeper uh, approximate uh, the, the time of the birth is actually around uh, five in the morning. So then after we, we all uh, tried to wait, we decided to wait a little longer and then at uh, 10 a.m., uh, approximately five hours after the birth started, uh, we decide to uh, give uh, 10 uh, international unit of oxytocin. And the oxytocin itself is uh, to induce her complete delivery of the fetus. And then after we wait uh, more longer, I think it's around three hours, uh, we decide to perform cesarean section because uh, these individuals uh, came from a uh, wild so we cannot uh, afford to lose any other uh, genetic material from the wild. So for the cesarean section procedure itself, uh, we gave a pre-medication of acepromazine malia. And then 15 minutes after that, we gave uh, ketamine as uh, anesthesia. And then uh, for the whole procedure, uh, I think around uh, 30, 38 minutes after the beginning of the induction, uh, we saw uh, another reflex. So at that time, we are still uh, st stitching her subcutan. So we gave another uh, top up of ketamine uh, in a lower dose. And then uh, as you can see, this is the preparation stages. Uh, we tried to make uh, well enough uh, place to do the emergency uh, procedure. So uh, we are uh, using a, a table and then we secure them, we restraint, uh, we restraint her. So later on, if uh, he, she's suddenly awake, we can still uh, have her in on top of the table. And then as you can see, the picture on the right uh, was the uh, fetus that was stuck in her vulva. And as you also can see that it is also still underdeveloped. And then this is the whole procedure uh, from the, this is actually the picture of the uterus. And from the uterus, we managed to pull uh, another two more fetuses, also the same, uh, still underdeveloped. And then after uh, we finish, uh, we uh, move to the recovery process. But before that, we try to uh, protect the surgery wound with some uh, sterile gauze and close them with, uh, uh, we call that uh, a plaster, so we can uh, give more uh, security to the wound itself. 
And then uh, for the post surgery and wound management, uh, we gave uh, Morin uh, long acting amoxicillin, which is antibiotic. And also for the painkiller, we gave her uh, meloxicam. And then uh, we gave the medication every 36 hours for 14 days. And then for the wound management itself, uh, we, we do the wound flushing and cleansing with 0.9% uh, natrium chloride solution. And then also uh, we dry uh, the solution, make it sterile, and then we give a powdered metronidazole, also another kind of antibiotic. And then later on, uh, same, uh, we dress them with sterile gauze and uh, a bandage. So this is how the, the wound uh, came out uh, after a week of uh, the procedure. Uh, this is actually the day one, and then this is a week after. We still can see uh, the shutters are still there, but we use a resorbable shutter, so we don't need to actually uh, manually remove the shutter itself. And then on day 10, we uh, and day 15, we found actually found a, a dried up a pus in a result of the immune, immune system uh, reflect the microbes. So then after that, we decide to uh, clean the wound more often. And then uh, day 17, this is, uh, we can still see the shutters are there. And then on day 25, actually the shutters are uh, gone completely. We actually uh, do need some uh, manual remove, removal for some shutters, but some are uh, already uh, absorbed. And then uh, on day 27, and then on day 30, we can see that the wound are closed almost completely. We only have a small uh, wound there. And then at that time, we decide to stop the uh, cleansing method. And whenever the bandits uh, removed by itself, uh, we will uh, just monitor her and see if we need uh, another further for the uh, procedure, but uh, we get uh, after around two months, uh, she's in an isolation cage. Uh, we finally uh, can uh, clear the case, and she was put in back to her cage. So uh, next, uh, this is for our management plan ourselves. Uh, we really need to do more uh, breeding time management, which is uh, in our conclusion. Uh, both Maureen and Candice was considerably quite young to be uh, to to breed. So then uh, later on we we will uh, separate her uh, Maureen uh, to another cage. To I think uh, she was back to her isolation cage at that time. And then uh, possibilities to resist of any infectious cause of this occurrence. Uh, actually, uh, those uh, pigs already uh, through a screen uh, for the disease. Uh, as, uh, one of them are brucellosis, which is also uh, one of the possible cause of uh, dystochia or uh, uh, the problems in the uh, reproduction, but uh, they are also tested negative when they were came to the national park. And then we also try to build more uh, isolation cages for a uh, pregnant cell, and I'm sure it's really needed, but for now we are, uh, taking a rest from uh, breed any females, uh, female individuals in Baluran National Park actually until we knew uh, when is the right time. And then we also, I think it's also important to give more enrichment and food diversity and also the nutrition. We actually successfully breed uh, one of the females uh, at that time. Uh, she was from Taman Safari Indonesia, I think from uh, Cisarua, yeah. mm -hmm. I think she's from Bogor and we, we uh, breed her with our uh, wild, uh, wild pig and then we actually have uh, one male and one female piglet, but uh, sadly the male uh, piglet was uh, eaten by, uh, ate by the, the, the father. So, we now have uh, one uh, piglets in our enclosure. Thank you very much. That's uh, the end of my presentation and I will give, uh, give back uh, to Dr. Susan.
Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for an exciting and very diverse range of talks. So we do have a few questions. Um, so I uh, will give everyone time to think about some questions for Java and Warty Pigs because I also have one. But uh, we have a question for uh, Fadley about the, um, the sea turtle nesting. Two questions actually um, in, in North Sulawesi. Uh, so the question one, in your opinion and based on your data, what may cause the low hatching percentage of the sea turtle in your study area? So perhaps if you would like to answer that question first, and then I will give you question two from the same uh, people, Kael Ke Ka Haka in, I think, Nusateng Nusa Tengara Timor. Badly, are you there? Hmm. Can everyone still hear me or have? Has my internet done something silly? Your voice is very good, Dr. Susan. Okay, thank you. Good. Okay. Um, so, Fadley, hopefully you can come back uh, to, to, to answer, the, answer these questions, but I don't see anything else in the chat, so I will take this opportunity to ask two questions. Uh, one, uh, Pat Gono, I hope you are also still there. Um, I wanted to ask about the captive breeding program is is the program at the moment only between indonesian zoos or is it with uh, other zoos in in southeast asia oh dear <laughs> okay um We seem to have lost both Fadli and Pat Gono. Uh, Dr. Rudiar, are you still there? Uh, yes, Sam. Okay, great. Thank you. Right. I've lost my question. Hang on. Oh, there it is. Is there a much... My question is, do you think that you, that we, as conservationists, that we need a a husbandry manual about Javan warty pig. It's not a species that I know very well from other zoos. And I think maybe some of the work you are doing is some of the first work about trying to understand how to breed this uh, species. I just wonder if maybe there needs to be a bit more national, international collaboration to understand this because I think it is very good to share when things do not go to plan so that we can learn and understand to make things better. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Susan. Uh, can I answer now, actually? Because please, please answer, that. yes. Thank you, thank you very much. I must agree with you, actually. Uh, actually, it's also same for me. This species I only heard when I joined this program, which is actually, a. Uh, in Baluda National Park itself, the last time they record the occurrence of the word typic was in, I think it's around 1982. And then after that, uh, there are no uh, more records about the Sus Ferrucosus, but we do still have, um, I think, not uh, lots like how I uh, can uh, see them in other area, but there are some Sus Crofa here which is sad because the Susperocosus is the endemic species while the Susprofa is uh, the introduced species from, I'm, I believe it's from Europe, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so uh, yes, it's also uh, true, but there are also some species in the zoos actually, that's where, where we have uh, this uh, works along with, uh, actually one of them was uh, Pak Gono actually is also, uh, uh, worked with us before in our small uh, forum. And then we also have uh, Taman Safari and uh, Chikananga. 
and of course the uh, KLHK as well. And then, uh, yes, I believe it is, I think it is very important uh, because uh, one, it is, uh, I think uh, we also have some data of uh, behaviors of them, which can uh, really help uh, us uh, to uh, conserve uh, this species, like uh, how do we provide uh, the right habitats and uh, food, especially because uh, here we cannot easily give them a natural food source actually but then uh, we also learn from uh, a Baluran management plan uh, which is a very old document I think it was written in 1982 that they are prefer uh, some uh, type of uh, plants uh, such as uh, tamarind and then there are also amorphophallus here in Baluran that we try to give them but then uh, we can we also still cannot uh, uh, remove the unnatural uh, food such as uh, uh, cassavas and then uh, potatoes and also uh, we gave them extra protein source from the uh, food concentrates uh, it's a brand uh, food source uh, but i think yeah I, I i i think i absolutely agree with you that i think we we still we still uh, really far from uh, complement uh creating those uh guidelines but uh right now we are on on on, on the track to uh probably in the future uh, provide some sources to be able to create those uh guidelines for uh minutes this species i think uh, that would be my answer dr susan that's great thank you very much I think maybe try one more time fadley are you there think not. Okay. Um, hopefully, uh, you can catch his email and, and send your questions directly to him. Uh, we are now running a little bit late into your lunch and my breakfast. So, uh, and I have to come back after lunch and breakfast. Thank you very much to all of the speakers. Um, it's great to share so much knowledge about so many different species, so many different positive conservation approaches and learning from good science, how to make things better. Uh, so perhaps, uh, Afif, I, I will hand back to you and my great thanks to everyone. Um, I am speaking later on today, so I will have to go and have coffee and breakfast. But thank you very much to all our speakers and presenters. Okay, I thank you, Dr. Susan, for your amazing drive. Thank you for the amazing lecture from all the speakers talking about the diverse thing and may all of us get the value and benefit from the lecture. And finally, we come to the end of abstract presentation, which is closing. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for your coming and your nice attention. And after this, we'll be at lunch break until 2 p.m. UT 7 and continued by the expert talk. And there will be a closing ceremony at the evening. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm the master of ceremony. Forgive me for all my mistakes and thank you for your attention. Good. Afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. See you later. Indonesia is one of the largest archipelagic countries in the world, with more than 17,000 islands that spread over an area of more than 2 million kilometer squares. Indonesia is host to several unique ecosystems, containing a large number of diverse species. At least 10% of the world's flowering species, which counts to over 25,000 species, flourish in Indonesia. There are also 12% of the world's mammals, 16% of reptiles, 17% of birds, 6% of amphibians, and over 45% of fishes. 
all of which are parts of the nation slash biodiversity. In order to preserve its biodiversity, which also contributes hugely to the world, Indonesia has taken significant steps in accordance to the national and global target on biodiversity framework. The government has allocated more than 500 units of protected area spread throughout the country, with the total coverage area of 22 million hectares terrestrial and 20 million marine protected area. Because of its uniqueness and universal values, six protected areas are recognized as World Heritage Sites, 16 Biosphere Reserves, 7 Ramsar Sites, and 7 ASEAN Heritage Sites. Many studies and researches has also been conducted to identify plants and animals to assess their potential uses for medicine, food, energy, and biocontrol for a chemical hazard. Some community-driven activities such as ecotourism has also contributed to the effort to preserve Indonesia's biodiversity, which also encouraged cooperation among local stakeholders. The results are heartening. By 2019, Indonesia has been able to increase the population of endemic and priority species. Communities have also enjoyed benefits from this improved environment through ecotourism, environmental services, and other significant condition, which contribute to their quality of life as a whole. There is little doubt that Indonesia's vast biodiversity plays a hugely significant role in reducing the impacts of climate change. By preserving its biodiversity and its ecosystems, Indonesia can help support the entire planet's sustainability and ensure a better future for all humankind. Sejarah Fakultas Kehutanan UGM resmi didirikan pada tanggal 19 Desember 1949 dan merupakan universitas yang bersifat nasional. Selain itu, UGM juga berperan sebagai pengemban Pancasila dan sebagai universitas pembina di Indonesia. Pada saat didirikan, UGM hanya memiliki enam fakultas dan salah satu di antaranya adalah Fakultas Pertanian. Dalam perkembangan selanjutnya, melalui Surat Keputusan Menteri Perguruan Tinggi dan Ilmu Pengetahuan Nomor 99 tahun 1963, Fakultas Pertanian dan Kehutanan UGM terpisah menjadi tiga fakultas, yaitu Fakultas Pertanian, Fakultas Teknologi Pertanian, dan Fakultas Kehutanan. Dengan demikian, Fakultas Kehutanan UGM secara resmi dinyatakan berdiri pada tanggal 17 Agustus 1963. Dekan pertama Fakultas Kehutanan UGM adalah Profesor Insinyur Sudarwono Harjo Sudiro. Berdasarkan SK Direktur Jenderal Pendidikan Tinggi, SK Dirjen Dikti Nomor 163 tahun 2007 tentang pengaturan program studi dan surat keputusan rektor nomor 89 tahun 2010 tanggal 1 Februari 2010 mensahkan perubahan keempat program studi di Fakultas Kehutanan menjadi satu dengan nama program studi kehutanan program studi kehutanan terdiri dari empat bagian yaitu 1. Departemen Manajemen Hutan 2. Departemen Silvikultur 3. Departemen Teknologi Hasil Hutan dan 4. Departemen Konservasi Sumber Daya Hutan Di Fakultas Kehutanan terdapat Dewan Perwakilan Mahasiswa atau DPM yang berperan sebagai Badan Legislatif Mahasiswa dan Lembaga Eksekutif Mahasiswa atau LEM. Kemudian terdapat empat himpunan mahasiswa minat, diantaranya yaitu Keluarga Mahasiswa Manajemen Hutan atau KMMH, Himpunan Mahasiswa Budidaya atau Himaba, Family of Forest Product Technology atau Forestech, dan Family of Forest 
conservation atau forestation. Di samping itu, terdapat Badan Semi Otonom atau BSO yang meliputi organisasi pencinta alam atau Mapala Silva Gama, komunitas seni kehutanan atau KSK, keluarga mahasiswa Islam Kehutanan atau KMIK, dan Forestry Study Club atau FSC. Sedangkan International Forestry Student Association atau IFSA dan keluarga mahasiswa Kristen Kehutanan atau Bonita termasuk ke dalam non-BSO. FFI bekerja di Indonesia sejak tahun 1996, yaitu awalnya bersama dengan LIPI untuk melakukan penelitian-penelitian, terutama penelitian terkait dengan harimau Sumatera. Kemudian berkembang, kemudian kita ada kerjasama dengan Kementerian Lingkungan Hidup dan Kehutanan, waktu itu Kementerian Kehutanan, terkait dengan pengelolaan spesies-spesies yang dilindungi. Tantangan terbesarnya adalah kata kuncinya sebenarnya kepedulian. Ya, kata kuncinya adalah kepedulian. Kalau semua sudah peduli, maka secara umum sebenarnya pekerjaannya sudah dan. Tapi masalahnya itu, bagaimana kita mendorong semua pihak untuk peduli menyelamatkan planet kita ini bersama-sama. Itu tantangan yang paling besar. Kearifan lokal masyarakat juga sangat penting di sana. Jadi di lain pihak kita melihat ada ancaman, tapi di lain pihak juga kita melihat ada kearifan masyarakat untuk menjaga hutannya. Nah itu yang kita coba untuk dorong untuk dikembangkan. Planet kita ini yang sustain, sustaining the planet itu jangka panjang paling panjang kita. Jadi itu tujuan jangka panjang keberadaan FFI. Bukan hanya di Indonesia, tapi di dunia.